everyone. Welcome to the Power of Story Pod Storytelling Podcast. I'm Kat, your host, and today on the pod we have Christian Cannoli. Hi, Christian. Hi, Kat. So a little bit about Christian's background. Christian graduated from the UT Austin Public Relations Program and has a minor in Black Studies with a concentration in Business Foundations. Christian is an account ed- coordinator at M Booth, um, starting in a little bit. So Christian, could you start off by telling the listeners what uh, an account coordinator does and kind of what your day-to-day life uh, looks like with that? Yeah, absolutely. So I work at M Booth, which is a public relations firm in New York. And basically as an account coordinator, all I, uh, I work on a couple different brands. So I work on public relations efforts for 7-Eleven, Google, uh Moe's Southwest Grill which is like a the Chipotle of the East Coast and um Mercari which is um like a resale um platform and essentially I work with a bunch of different teams to help maximize uh communication efforts uh, make sure that they're getting coverage in the news all the cool stuff like that so I sit in on a lot of brainstorms I sit in on a lot of internal weekly meetings with clients and we talk about how we're going to get them uh, coverage, how we're going to get them to go viral, how we're going to do stuff like that. So that is basically day to day what it kind of looks like. But I just started since I just got out of college. So i um, really excited and really loving uh, my first job so far. Yeah. So speaking of college, you in previous conversations have described your college experience as electric which I think is a way that everyone would like to look back on their college experience. Um, And so you are also a transfer student and you were a nursing student at Texas Women's University. Um, And then you did a big switch and came to UT and became a PR major. So can you, I guess, describe a little bit of your experience and what made you decide to make those changes? Yeah, so I mean, I started out as a nursing major. When I got out of high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I was a theater kid for a really long time. And then I realized that I didn't really want to do that in my uh, adult life and that it wasn't going to pay the bills. So <laughs> I I was like, well, well, I guess I'll just be a nurse. I like people and like I like making people feel good and healthy and stuff. So I volunteered at a couple hospitals and did some work like that. And essentially realized that I sucked at chemistry and I just did not like nursing and there was a real lack of creativity. Like I wasn't able to, you know, do things the way that I wanted to do. I mean, nurses are told what to do and then you and then you go with the doctor's orders. And I realized I needed something a lot more collaborative, a lot more creative, a lot more self-starting. So I actually got in contact with someone who was a PR director of a hospital. And then I was like, okay, that sounds cool. Don't want to do that for a hospital though, <laughs> but I like the stuff that you're doing. So and then I just up and moved to Austin. I'd never been there before. Um, so I just up and moved. And that was my life. It was really kind of scary. I moved to a bigger city with a school that had 50,000 people and I didn't know anyone. <laughs> so it was kind of jarring, um, but it was such the right move for me. And I, what, I, I exponentially happier with um, my work life and um, the school that I went to but yeah it was it was a it was a wild road to get there yeah I feel like that transition at any age is tough and in college I feel like that's especially hard like would be especially hard so like what did you learn from that experience and how do you grow out of it yeah so I when I started, I was a nursing major for a year. And so I moved over to UT when I was a sophomore. And the thing that I realized being a transfer student at and at around like sophomore year was during freshman year, everyone builds these core friend groups, right? Like you have your sort of interest groups or clubs that you're joining or orientations and you meet these people and, you know, maybe they live in your dorm, maybe they're in the same classes as you and you really grow like a foundational, usually a really large group of friends, which is what I had at TWU. And then when I ended up, you know, leaving them to go to UT, I realized that I had to be a lot more tenacious when I was starting with, okay, how am I going to connect with other people? How am I, I'm a very social person. I'm not, I am not a person that likes solitude. So (laughs) 
moving and and trying to find my 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 group was something that was really really important for me and honestly and i feel like this is what everyone says like any orientation uh leader is going to tell you this any organiz organization person is going to tell you this any teacher is going to tell you this you have to get out of your comfort zone you you have to you have to take that extra step you know you have to talk to that person that looks cool but also intimidating you have to talk to the person who you're like oh no they're gonna think i'm weird and needy but you're like you know what you gotta do it and most 90 percent of the time it works out really really well and even those times that it doesn't you know you learn and you and you grow and you find better people and 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 i think that was the number one thing that it really took for me was just to be more tenacious and to really get out of my comfort zone and meet new people and try new things yeah yeah um so i guess shifting gears a little bit um corporate america has, unfortunately has a very negative history of not being the most inclusive place and so as a black transgender person how has that experience been navigating um, into that workforce. I know that you've had a lot of um, internships and you've kind of been in corporate America for lo a long time to some extent. Um, what has that experience been like for you and how have you made a place for yourself within corporate America? Yeah, so I mean, even as someone with different sort of intersections, whether it's racial, gender, like any type of intersections, it's always, uh, you know, difficult as coming in as a marginalized person into corporate America. And the thing, when I started my first few internships, it was a lot of, it was a lot of teaching. It was a lot of my coworkers didn't know how to address me or my coworkers didn't necessarily know what my gender meant or what that meant for them in terms of regarding me. And it was a lot of teaching, which is obviously something that I, as a, as a person who wants other people to learn, I, I did, but it also took a lot of emotional energy and, uh, and stock out of myself to put into other people to make sure that they knew how to address me. And even at a couple of my internships, I had unfortunate experiences of having to use the bathroom several, several floors up on the lobby floor so that you know, there was no one ever there and I didn't have to worry about going into the men's restroom and being looked at weird or going into the women's restroom and being looked at weird. And it was a lot of, it was a lot of, okay, how can I compartmentalize myself to make this easier for other people and make my coworkers' lives easier? And I think the point that, and, and that's just not sustainable, right? It's not sustainable to take those parts of yourself and compartmentalize and remove them from your workplace because you, you are who you are every time you enter your work any any workplace anywhere so the thing that it really took for me going on this journey because I also was transitioning during that time I didn't identify as trans until I was 19 and I was already sort of in the professional world at that point and it and I was going through transitions also at like going to different companies and things so the thing that I really took from it and the thing that is keeping me here still working and the, the the way that I keep myself from getting burnt out is really to and and it, and it's always it's not ideal but to pick your battles if if you are if if you are feeling good about making sure that this person addresses you the the way that you need to or checking someone on a really ignorant thing that they said go for it and do it but the other thing is you have to make room for yourself. If you are burnt out and tired and you're not able to do it that day, don't do it that day and don't feel guilty for that. Um, and, and, the, and the second thing is really, really prop yourself up with the best allies possible. Allies aren't just there to be like, go you, you're cool, I, I love you, uh, I include you. Like being an ally is central to supporting that person. And that means if someone is uh, being transphobic, if someone's being racist, if someone's being homophobic, your ally should be there for you to step in. Your ally should be there for you. And you need to find those allies in the workplace because it's, it's not sustainable uh, otherwise. And I think that in that process of learning and that process of allyship, a lot of people build themselves up and they build up that confidence to say, oh, you know what, I'm not trans but I'm going to make sure that any trans person that ever does come here or is here in this workplace feels included and feels not just included as a part of the conversation, but feels respected. 
and feels and feels valid and valued in that space. So I think making sure that you are being uh, conscientious of your mental and um, emotional well-being while also surrounding yourself with that great support support system that will stand up for you when there's those times that you can't stand up for yourself that's what's going to be key and that's what's been key to me and it's a process right because i'm still i'm still learning that every different workplace that i go to every different project i'm on you have to find those allies and but it, it's keeping me it's keeping me there and it's keeping me around so um yeah <laughs> that's amazing thank you for sharing that and your experience, you've worked at a lot of different places, as you said before, for companies, what's, what's policies that you, or what are policies that you think are a good place, are good for transgender people and um, other people of sectionality, of intersectionalities, what do companies do right and what do you think they should like include in other policies to yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, one of those really, really basic things that a lot of people miss out on is making sure that you're including pronouns um, in your email signatures, in your intros with different teams, um, anywhere. Making it a common thing to ask about people's pronouns when you first meet them, not just to assume that someone uses certain pronouns or some like that making sure that you are being as proactive as possible to address everyone the way that they want to be addressed. Um, that is like base, base level, like first thing that you should like that, that a company needs to do. And that's really easy. Um, and I, and I think even, you know, taking a step up from that, making sure that you have an advocacy sort of program. So a lot of um, PR agencies and ad agencies, and I'm sure a lot of other companies have what are called, um, ERGs, employee resource groups. So those are groups that work with different sort of uh, groups of employees. So there's some um, ERGs that are for Black employees, or some that are for Latinx employees, or some that are for working parents, or some that are for um, people who have um, um, anxiety disorder, and, uh, and, and, and having those places not just outside of the workplace and finding support outside, but making sure that you have a, a core support system inside and people that you can share stories with and people that you um, have solidarity with in the workplace, wherever it is that you are. Um, other things are as um, tactile as, you know, making sure that you are advocating for gender neutral restrooms in all your facilities, um, making sure that there are, you know, as, as our government continues to um, sort of strip trans people of their um, employment rights, their, their, their health care um, access, it's, it's crucial to make sure that your workplace is not just knowledgeable about those things, but that they're taking a proactive step to making sure that trans people are heard in their workplace and that what they're advocating for is being done and there's there you can sometimes get in the trap of oh oh yeah um you know we're, we're actively working on that and and we'll, we'll we'll work on that down the road and you know honestly it takes those allies and it takes those people in that workplace to, to hold them accountable and be like this isn't down the road this isn't something that can wait uh, job security for trans people isn't something that can wait Healthcare access for trans people isn't something that can wait and to make sure that you are, you know, being proactive as they're saying they're being proactive and checking them on those things. Um, making sure that there's diversity and inclusion initiatives for recruitment, for retention in the workplace and things like that. And then also just celebrating those moments, celebrate pride with your company, celebrate Black History Month with your company and, those, and all those types of things and make sure that those efforts are being led by Black people, by trans people, not just by people that wanna put up the rainbow flag and say that everything is gonna be cool and that they love gay people and then at the end of the month they turn it off. Like make sure that they are actively working and not just working for you, but working for other people down the road that might be coming into that organization as well. Yeah. Um, as a transgender person of color, things can weigh on your mental health very heavily. And you did talk a little bit about how to take care of yourself and what steps you take to be kind to yourself at all points. What 
are some small things that you do day to day or large ways that you take care of your mental health and in the workplace and how you maintain a good relationship with that? Yeah, um, actually something that has been affecting me a lot recently that I really have been trying to prioritize is listening to myself because as a marginalized person of any experience, a large majority of our experience is us being told, oh, that's not a big deal or don't worry about that, or um, yeah, that's not really gonna happen, or are you sure you didn't just, you should have done this, or are you sure you didn't do this right, or they, they, they wanna make it seem like your intersections and that those things that are, the, those, those core parts of you are seen as complicated, and they're seen as complicated for HR, they're seen as complicated for your teams, or complicated for your managers, and sometimes, at me as a as a as a as a black trans person i've i've internalized those things and i've been like okay well i have to make sure that you know even if this person misgenders me that they don't feel bad for misgendering me even maybe i should correct them maybe i shouldn't well you know and and it and it weighs down because the core um piece of that the core piece of that is me gaslighting myself me telling myself that oh, well, it's because you didn't do this, or it's because you, they, or, or they're trying their hardest. And the thing that is, that, that I'm trying to prioritize a lot my, right now is listening and being honest with myself. Am I really, like being honest with myself in the sense that, am I really, am I really overthinking this? Am I really, looking too deep into this or do I feel uncomfortable or do I feel discriminated or do I feel not listened to or do I feel disenfranchised those things are real and listening to yourself is central because at the end of the day you're the only person you have and as a marginalized person and there's not and 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 when and when there's people out there that don't want you to be heard and pe when there's people out there that don't want you to be listened to it's so central for you to listen to yourself and be truthful with yourself and not to feel sorry for saying something isn't right and something needs to be done about this and that even just listening to myself and being and being honest with myself is something that is so key to my mental health and that's something that i'm still working on and something that i will be forever working on i'm sure um but even like smaller things taking breaks taking deep breaths if someone you know if someone discriminates you in the workplace take an hour and a half off do it like <laughs> what a, do it take the hour take the day do what would do what what feels good for you and do what feels right for you and not what you think down the line your employer would have wanted you to do you are central to yourself and I mean I don't know if this is like the right thing to say but work is just work work is just work everyone has to work we have to work to live, to make money, to eat, to, to, to sustain ourselves. But work is also just work. If, 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 it's, if it's weighing on you and it's really, really affecting your mental health, be open to looking at employment in a new place if that's possible for you. And it's one of the things that I have to tell myself all the time is you're working for brands that have a lot of money. If you mess something up or you take the day, that's not going to affect them. Like that's not going to, that, that, that's not going to bother them. You do what you have to do to keep yourself alive and keep yourself happy and keep yourself sane. And I think whether that's taking breaks, whether that's taking vacations, whether that's having a really open, honest conversation with my manager or HR or a coworker that I need to check on something, all that stuff is central to me and central to my experience and I have to do those things so things aren't options and I think it's learning what is the priority for you and making sure that that is a priority in your in your action oriented life so my, the, like one thing that my therapist always tells me is you know those those anxieties and 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 those things come when there's an incongruence in the way that you want your life to be and in the way that you're living your life and making sure that I'm being truthful to myself is the thing that helps, helps meld that incongruence and helps make me feel central to myself. And yeah, I think that's it. I think, I think, I think, I, I think I said it in, in that, in that spiral of, of, of words. <laughs> I, I think everything you said was really beautiful. And I think that 
everyone should be taking notes on that um, and how to take care of themselves. And um, so yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, and so in the next few weeks, you're about to make another major change and that's <laughs> moving to New York City in all of the craziness that's happening right now. Um, how are you feeling about that? And are you excited? What are you looking forward to? What are you nervous about? I'm so excited. I've been wanting to move to New York since I, I actually lived in New York last summer when I was there working with a company and I lived in Brooklyn Heights and I commuted there and it was, I commuted to work every day and I loved it. I loved everything about it. I've wanted to move to New York since I was very, very young. Uh, you know, like moving to the big city, that was always something that I always wanted to do. And I guess this is me doing it and and saying you know coronavirus is still here and taking all the steps that i need to do to do that safely but also making sure that i'm living my life and also making sure that i'm not using these things as an excuse to not do what i want to do because honestly new york is better right now than texas is so it does kind of make sense so i was just like you know i'm 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 very excited i found um i found a really great living space with um it's actually a cooperative living space with um like a few other people and i've always wanted to live in a community and i think in coronavirus that's also very central when you're living in a pandemic and everyone has to stay home i think living with people and being able to establish community is something that is so core to myself and something that is core to a lot of our a lot of a lot of people um as we're not just you know so, like beings that like to be in solitude um but I'm very anxious about it. I'm very excited about it. I, I, my friends have been like, oh my God, get up here already. And I'm just, I'm so excited to be up there and I'm so excited to, you know, start living my life. Yeah, yeah, that's so exciting. Um, so I guess kind of a fun question that when you said that you were into theater, I was like, okay, well, I have to know what's, the favorite production slash favorite role or I guess your favorite musical or play. Oh, wow. Okay. So <laughs> you can give a uh, list too. You can give a list. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, so just context. I was a, I was a theater person for years. I was in theater ever since I was like five I want to say and I was doing things consistently up until I was 19 years old so I've done a lot of things I've uh, been in a lot of plays done a lot of musicals done a lot of dancing um, but I think my favorite I guess it's not necessarily a a role but it was probably my it was my first real life like performance getting paid like my first real gig and it was working <laughs> i worked at six flags over texas and i was a performer in one of their like big shows that they had they had like these huge auditoriums with these shows that had like big budgets with like lights and 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 sounds and and, and air conditioning and like everything and it was great um, but it was like my first real like performing experience and actually my last performing experience, <laughs> but, um, it was, it was really fun. I met a lot of like really great people that I'm still friends with today. And even though there, we were performing like pop songs from like the sixties all the way to like the current day. And I was singing, like, I was like singing like Bruno Mars and like, like disco music and like a lot of other stuff. And I was just like, you know what? The, even though I'm never going to listen to these songs again when I get out of this, it's still really fun to be here. And I met some of the best people ever. And I got to ride the rides for free at Six Flags. So that was pretty cool, too. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's probably um, my favorite one. Okay. How is that experience <laughs> performing at such a young age, starting at five? I don't feel like that's very normal to most people. How has that shaped who you are? That's and that, that's that it's really interesting that you asked that because that's something that i really think about a lot and something that oh wait i gotta charge i gotta put in my my charger because this understand my, my computer's complaining <laughs> Ugh, okay okay it's wait it's plugged in yeah okay it's good um so performing and doing theater was something that I see is really, really, really central to who I am now, just because not really like I don't even listen to musicals that much that often anymore. I don't go to plays near as often. I don't 
do stuff like that. Um, like I don't do community theater or anything like that. But the thing that I really feel is central is learning how to just speak and learning how to be yourself and learning how to convey that to other people. And so even in, in plays and musicals where you're adopting a character and you're becoming that character, you still have to do the background research on that character, learn who that character is, learn who that person is, and then become that person and adopt that on stage and project that out so that someone else you know, can see that and be like, wow, yeah, I really believe that they're playing that character. And in a lot of ways, I feel like in my workplace, I'm doing a lot of like presenting, I'm doing a lot of talking with like really big companies and I have to pitch them ideas that I really, really want them to, to establish in their, in their whatever communications plan or anything. And I really do feel like being in theater just taught me a how to be loud. It taught me how to, because when you stand on that stage, you got a huge, a huge auditorium to fill and you got to make sure that everyone can hear you. So making sure that I'm heard is one. And that means a lot of things also in speaking, but also in what I'm saying and making sure that I'm, I'm articulating everything that I want to say. And then second, I think it taught me a lot about how to really be present and really how to just be in yourself and, even if that isn't for another person, like if you're not giving a presentation, just like being around and being out in public, like being yourself and feeling like yourself. And I think performing in a lot of ways taught me how to, in, in teaching me how to adopt someone else and how to become someone else, it taught me a lot of how, what it means to become myself and what it means to be myself and what it means to do that, not just for myself, but to do that proudly and to make sure that other people know who I am. Um, yeah, that's definitely what that taught me. It also taught me a lot of really bad show tunes that I don't listen to anymore, but. <laughs> that, that's growth. That's growth. It's not that is growth. Anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, I guess kind of a final question. What advice would you give to someone a little bit younger, um, thinking about a career in PR? I think I would tell them I would tell them come with your own ideas, you know, what, look at other things that you are really inspired by and, and, and collect those things. Like really look at those things that inspire you, that make you feel good, that you want other people to see. Save all that stuff, journal it down, like save it in a folder, paint it, do whatever, but take stock of all that and look at what all that means to you and say, what is the what is, what is it that's here that I want to tell the world? And, and, and storytelling is the best way to do that. And whether that is for me is making sure that I can integrate some way for people of color, for queer people, for poor people, for uh, anyone to be integrated into any sort of campaign that we're doing, any sort of work that we're doing and make sure that they're central to that conversation, whatever that means for you and whatever that means for you on part of a brand if you like a certain brand and you want to work for them or you think they're great you know look at them and see what values you have in yourself and what values they have and then see like how that how that plays off of itself and see how those things are congruent with each other and then you know shoot your shot like did like do there's so much room in this industry to move around. There's so much room for new ideas and growth. And there's a lot of room for growth. There's a lot of growing that needs to be done in this industry. Um, and I think anyone that is of a younger experience, anyone who is younger has such a valuable perspective. And, you know, don't discount that. Share what you wanna share, do what you wanna do. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing all of your knowledge and wisdom and all your, your theater history um, with us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, we really appreciate it. And I so enjoyed talking to you, Christian. Thank you so much for having me, Kat. I'm so happy that I got to share this and I'm so happy to talk to you. Yeah, it's so much fun. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in and um, see you guys next time. Uh...